what's hidden in him. Just make a sound, light, 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 light. Oh, light, light, light,
battle for the souls of nations. The souls of nations. Already Ireland and Spain. The Lord is doing battle for the souls of nations. To bring them in, back into his creation that he intended on them to live in their destiny. The Lord is doing battle for the souls of nations to bring them back to the original creation he made them to be. Prophesy. So when the minstrel came and played, Elisha prophesied. And he prophesied water in trenches where there was no rain. And there was no way to have water, but it created something that God could work in and bring a creative prophetic word into Elisha's moment. Oh, yeah. So what we do now is we begin to prophesy in crisis. Elisha, Elisha prophesied at Jericho. When the prophets of Jericho, who were prophesying from their soul, not their spirit, not from the spirit, but from the soul, a place of anguish, and they prophesied. And they were saying, this is a good city, when in actuality it was a cursed city. Joshua had spoken the curse over that city. And they said, it's a good city. They couldn't tell the difference. And so a cursed city that had no good water to drink, a prophetic word, not from the soul, but from the spirit. Brought an oasis of water that is still there to this day. Known as Elisha Springs. So today, begin to prophesy in this frequency of sound. And what we're playing today, begin to prophesy today out of the spirit. Not from the anguish of your soul. Not from where your soul's been injured, wounded, and hurt 
believe and prophesy from your spirit what you want that cursed land to be. Do it in your nations. Do it in your cities. Do it in your county states. Do it in your homes. Do it among your family right now. Come on and begin to prophesy. Oh, prophesy. 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 Prophesying life into a cursed place, barren ground. No matter what someone is seeing, no matter what they're saying, you can prophesy life into your barren ground. A, prophes a prophetic word that comes from life, that comes from the Spirit of God, and not the anguish of a soul, but a prophetic word that comes from the Spirit of God can absolutely create an oasis that can never be killed, never die. It will always bring forth life in that cursed place. And it's waiting on a prophetic word. It's waiting on that. Elisha brought it in his day. It's time for you to bring it in yours. Though these wicked people and wicked nations around the world, though these begin to prophesy constantly, of your death, your demise, your lack, and all of these things, prophesying shortages in a world where there is no shortages, prophesying climate change when the climate's been moving up and down since the day Adam fell. There's always summer, winter, spring, and fall. Prophesying death, trying to scare the people into believing 
God didn't provide enough for us in this time. When the greatest ball of energy and the greatest ball of power that's ever existed in the natural is right above us called the sun. And they're trying to prophesy shortages, trying to say there's not enough. Oh, but you forget, O oh vain man, who seeks to control men with, ty with tyranny, that you, they serve a God and a God created all of this that if there was a shortage, he would just create more. He could just make more. And he said he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that any, anyone can dare ask or think. And if you can think it, he's above you. So now they seek to collapse your world around you. They seek to collapse the world around you and make you in the confines of a shorter and a smaller and a smaller and a smaller place while the elites and the globalists still live outside that circle of, of confinement. But they want you to live in the circle of confinement until it comes all the way down, until there's only an elite group of people left out here and a small group of people to serve them in here. That's not the will of God. It's never been the will of God. It's never been the will of God. And I'm going to tell you something. Population control is not anything new. What do you think they were doing in Egypt? The more they afflicted the Hebrews, they were trying to kill them. They were trying to work their population down. They were trying to make their lives with rigor and, and cause them to serve with rigor until their lives they would die early. But instead they just flourished and they kept growing and they kept growing until they said, kill all their firstborn males, throw them into the Nile. Let the crocodiles have them. Let the crocodiles have them. <clears throat> they were trying to keep the population down trying to keep it down that's never been a that's not a new concept they've been trying to do that ever since if there's ever a tyrant it always comes into view somewhere elites scream throw their heads back and talk like brazen fools they just roll their eyes back and talk like fools like they have something to say and yet they scream and wail and cry all the way to the grave some of you in this great reset, you want to create an antichrist world for him to come. You will never live to see that, for you've challenged the Almighty. Where time affects you, it does not affect him. He just makes more if needed. He can speed up time, time can move backward, it's almost as if he's creating more of it. But he only does that in the faith and the declaration of his people. And we'll just ask for more time. And it'll roll back. And we'll be given it. But your age keeps going. Remember this. It would, it would be the first point of wisdom you've ever known. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Time runs a circle. Time runs a circle. Yeah, what has been will be again. And God requires that which is past. And everything you see, everything you see in the way of tears not last even in the days of antichrist seven years is all he gets he can't make it happen and so he's confined forever in the pit The pit. 
Joshua called for time. Elevaru Rishi, Elevaru Gangeles, he paro, era paro, sikashe. So he could finish fighting. If Joshua called for more time, he said, Sun stand still. Stand still, it obeyed. Joshua was given another day. Out in the courtyard, 
go back and tell Hezekiah he's gonna live longer. Isaiah went back and told him, you got 15 more years. Hezekiah perked up with joy when he heard that said in his ears, his righteousness. His righteousness Yeah, His righteousness How do I know I will recover He asked What do you want God to show you with the time sundown to go forward or back the prophet asked it's a light thing to go forward but now let it go back to what was past and so it did sing a small child and false future has been spoken over him but the true future is he will live he will live for there's a false future in the earth and there's a true future in the earth now see his little legs moving towards it for someone told you differently and they blame God for its faults false future for the true future is he will live he will live his legs will move his legs will move his voice will, will cry. For in conception, they cry their future. They cry their future. We pull those words down in Jesus' name. They will not live. They will not live. Well, the true future is his legs will move. And his voice will speak. For 
God is life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Begin to say that. God is life. God is life. Did you hear what the Lord said? There's a false future in the earth and a true future in the earth. Hallelujah. We speak the true. Hallelujah. Well, we'll be right back after this. We want to play a little bit more and take us to this next part. Come on. We speak alive. We speak alive. We speak alive. We speak alive. I want to welcome you back to the 11th hour today. 
It's already been a powerful 11th hour. We, we just began to play, and the Lord had given us those chords a few weeks ago. And man, then he wrote the song standing here on the stage. Wasn't that amazing? Sound, frequencies. Then he started dealing with time, and he started dealing with things. Hallelujah. Well, Lord, we thank you right now. I ask you, Lord, to give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And Lord, give our partners eyes to see and ears to hear. Those watching all over the world, Lord, that, the, that we can learn your word together as a family. We're a family, Lord. And I give you praise, Lord. They're your people, but they're my family. And they're your family. And I ask you, Lord, that we learn to become one in you as Jesus is in you. And we're one with him. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I want us to, uh, I want to start right here with something today. Um, you know, uh, we'll be talking somewhat about the soul, and the soul was mentioned when we were playing because the Lord has had me on that subject. And um, I'm going to be teaching in our Bible college about the soul. And, um, but there is the soul of a nation also, as well as an individual. And I want to just touch on that for a few minutes. The attack on the soul of a nation. Uh, this kind of attack is not unlike the attack on a person's soul. You know, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5. Let, let, me, let me get my, my word out here. Hold on just a minute. I want us to, um, I got my new nation covenant Bible cover for a little while here. And I want us to look at, at uh, 1 Thessalonians. And we're going to go over there to chapter 5. And I want us to see that. It's going to be a little bit different today, but it's going to be good. It's, uh, it's anytime the Lord's doing something, it's good. Amen. Now, uh, let me get here with you. Hallelujah. Now listen to chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus. Notice he made a difference in that, spirit and soul and body. Now, a nation has a soul. Now, the, knowing the difference in the spirit, soul, and body is very important, but the soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. The soul is a middleman between the spirit world and the natural world. And just like a person, a nation has a soul. And the souls of nations the Lord was talking about today. The spirit of this nation is freedom. That's the spirit of America. This was the cry in 1776, freedom. That cry was tried to be... It, they tried to shut it out, shut it down in every way. In those days, the tyrant king in Great Britain, King George, attempted to shut it down. But what this nation was founded on began to climb to the surface. We are founded, we were founded because we love Jesus. Israel was founded because God loved Israel, but we were founded because we loved him. We were founded on the ultimate freedom that began to surface in men as the cry to take the gospel to the ends of the earth grew. Now that's really the root cause of all freedom is, is God placed that within us. He placed that when he stretched himself on Adam. All our declaration of independence is, is not just for this nation. It was the freedom of all men was written down. God-given freedom, uh, uh, nature and nature's God. That's our rights, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. But that's actually the freedoms of all men everywhere. And when God stretched himself on Adam, on Adam, 
and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of lives. When he did, the Bible said his soul became alive. He became a living soul. And his soul could mediate between heaven and earth. It was the middleman between the spirit world and the natural world. And so in this, in a nation, it's the same way. This was the cry of freedom that was down inside every man's being. And it is every man to this day all over the world. And when God begins to pull on men to take the gospel to the world, take the gospel. That's why when somebody gets saved, they absolutely just, they can't help it. They have to go and tell, go and tell, go and tell. And when that cry grew in this country, and it began to grow in this nation, then that freedom that was breathed into Adam began to surface. It was obvious what this nation was held down by, what kind of tyranny was involved. Did you know that it was because, now, now you think about this, it became very glaring and obvious why this nation was, was under such bondage. It's, it was illegal to print a Bible here in English. You couldn't print a Bible in English. In these colonies of the United States that later became the United States, you couldn't print a Bible in English. You could print it in any other language but not English. The first congressional Bible ever printed was by Mr. Aiken, the Aiken Bible. I have a couple of those. Uh, Robin has one. It was given to us, and <clears throat> not the originals, but we have the copies of the congressional Bible. But it was against the law then to preach the gospel. And that ought to tell you what tyranny came to hold down was the gospel. You couldn't print the Bible. They didn't want the Bible to, to be spread. It was, and it was all over money. And the love of money is the root of all evil. It was money and laws. When laws begin to hinder the spread of the gospel, then it is a tyrannical law then that's the first imposition of tyranny. It's to stop the gospel. It always wants to stop the gospel. Why? Because the, the, the word is light and the light shines in darkness and the darkness can't con comprehend it. It can't fight it off. It can't hold light down. And so if they're going to rule people and keep people under bondage, they must mess with the gospel. But when that starts coming up in people, people may not even know what that is. But when they start crying for freedom, what they're doing is they're hearing the original call and the desire to take the gospel, the good news to the world is just rising up within them. And so when laws begin to hinder the spread of the gospel, then it's a, a, a tyrannical law. In those days, you could print the Bible in any other uh, language, but not English. Tyranny is always ultimately about keeping the Scripture away from the people. Now, that's what the Dark Ages were about. You've heard of the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages was to keep the Scripture away from the commoners. In other words, away from you and me. Don't let them read it for themselves because if they read it, they'll be free. They can't read it for themselves, and so it was against the law for them to expound the Scriptures to what was known as the commoners. And that's the dark ages. The light was taken from the people. The light was taken away from them. Now, the light was withheld, and therefore the dark ages reigned. Yet the light of the original creation of man is in a man's DNA. Men begin to cry for it. They long for it. When men begin to tell you what you can do with the Bible and its teaching, you know tyranny is trying to take hold on the people. Uh, recently, the new Speaker of the House, you know, and, and I wanted, I was going to teach on something else, but the Lord said teach on this. But recently, the Speaker of the House, our new Speaker of the House, came under attack because he had a pastor come and pray, and, and they didn't like it, and the Democrat Party just really attacked him because they, he had taken a stand, a biblical stand, against the LGBTQ and, and all that kind of stuff. And the speaker was slammed for not being, get this, mindful 
are, are of diversity. They're trying to make it seem like homosexuality, transgenderism, and all of that is now the normal. Well, it's not the normal. Not at all. The soul of the nation is being attacked. The soul has to be attacked. They're trying to change it. They're trying to change the soul of this nation. But to do this, they will eventually have to change and rewrite the Bible in order to make it work. We're in a perfect position right now in the world for deception. If it is rewritten, if the Bible is rewritten, then after a while it all changes. The world of Sodom and Gomorrah lies before this nation and the world. We are right now in the valley of decision. The moral climate of this of the nation will change drastically if they are able to change the soul of the nation and of any nation. The Bible does not support the views of the LGBTQ or groups with those views, but it will if it's rewritten. Now, eventually what they'll do is have AI rewrite the Bible. And I, I was, I began to watch some things on, on uh, just some clips on YouTube and things like that. And it was pretty awesome. I mean, it was like the life of a prophet, life of Jeremiah, Elijah. And, and it would show these, and it was obvious an AI had done it and had done the artwork in it and all the pictures because it was stunning. It was just pristine pictures if you've ever seen those and you know they can punch it into an AI and say write me a or draw me a picture of this event and it'll bring back a stunning almost like a 4D thing or something I don't know a 3D thing but it will come back and you'll look at it and say wow and then they put these voices behind it and that and they start telling the story the biblical story and I'm watching it and I'm thinking man this is good this is strong look at this and then I was led to look at another. And then I began to notice in the other one. And I began to notice as in these stories. Now, it was, it was pristine, vivid color. I don't even know how to have the words to explain how I've never seen it like this. And the voice is compelling and, and everything is, and it's going along there. And you can sense the anointing. And then all at once, because it's the word. The anointing's on the word. And then all at once. That's how unsaved people can preach and get people saved. Because it's the word's anointed. And the word goes forth out of God's mouth and it will re not, not return to him void. But it will accomplish the thing wherein to he sent it and it will prosper in that thing. That's how you, a lot of people would not even saved preach the gospel. And people got saved. Well, it's because the Word is anointed. So anyway, it's going along here, and I'm looking at this, and it's so, man, I'm thinking, wow. And I, and I love to, to study the life of prophets, you know, the prophets in the Scripture. And they have a unique role, and, I'm, I'm, and I identify with that. And I'm looking at it, learning, trying to glean from them. And all at once, something dawned on me. They took you right up to this one part and left it out. It was just left out. I mean, this whole big miracle was just left out. And it went right to another part of the story. But it made it seem like it just seemed together flawlessly. And then I got to notice and I thought, wait a minute. Some of this is out of order. This is not the way it reads. This, is, this happened at another place or another time or something. And it struck me as strange. And then I began to watch it. And I knew what I was looking at. An AI was doing this. Somebody was using this technology to do this. Well, I want you to think about this. If it starts leaving out passages and parts of the story, then it gets things out of order but there's enough truth to make it fascinating to the soul. 
It gets your whole being involved. Your spirit, because most of the story is the word. Your soul, because of the stunning life, like pictures it employs. And your body, because the truth it does, quote, is anointed and causes your feelings to engage. And most of the church judges God anyway by goosebumps. They'll start talking about God and say, look, man, I got goosebumps. Oh, boy, look at who, who, I just got chills all over. Well, a, a bucket of ice would give you chills too. You can't judge a, a God by chills. Now, it can make your body react. So you've got the whole spirit, soul, and body involved here. Your feelings because you have been in the word and you're satisfied. I feel like I've studied now. The problem is that the parts left out or redefined begin to make a new story. And guess what? There's a new Bible. The soul of this nation is the Declaration of Independence. The body of this nation is the people. The system of law in this nation is by which that freedom is distributed is the U.S. Constitution, and it's all based on the Holy Bible. Rewrite the Bible, you rewrite it all. You redefine it all. Whatever is in the soul is carried to the body. As a man thinks, so is he. Therefore, the soul has to be corrupted. Any attempt to change the Constitution is an attack on the soul of the nation. Biden made it very clear and the Democrat Party what the battle was over. Remember? Battle for the soul of the nation. So when you start looking at things like that, we are at the time of great deception. We're all in the valley of decision right now. We're in the place where we decide, are we going to be the very elect that can be fooled? You need to take notice. It took a moment to realize they had left these parts out. Well, you put enough of that together and you got a new Bible. You got a brand new Bible. You know, there used to be something called the quick scan Bible. And it was like, you, it was the whole Bible, but it would have certain words highlighted. And you just read those words and your mind kind of automatically took the context of what was being said. And I appreciate all that it, that it made people do and they studied and this and that. But there's a lot of detail between those words that need to be meditated on. If not, it can rewrite it according to your thoughts. I hope anybody's hearing this today. Now, I want us to go over to Genesis um, chapter 35. Let's look at that. And I, I want to show you something just about the soul. I, I feel like I should tell you this today. Genesis 35. Uh, let me be sure that's where we are here or where we need to be. Praise God. Now, Let's look at verse 16. This is talking about Jacob. I mean, uh, yeah, Jacob, Rachel, Leah, all of them, they were traveling. It said, they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath, or Ephrath. And Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. Notice how the Bible says it. She had hard labor. And it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, stop the fear. Thou shalt have this son also. She had Joseph, and she only had Benjamin herself. And it came to pass, and this is the birth of Benjamin, and it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died. But notice the Bible makes it plain that her soul was in departing. She called his name ben, Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. Benoni means son of pain. 
son of pain. She's prophesying out of her soul. Her soul is in anguish. But now I want you to notice Jacob's soul is in anguish also. He worked 14 years to get her hand. He loved her that much. And it said it, the seven years that, that he did have to wait for her again, he said that seven years that he was waiting for her, working for her, for her to earn her hand from her father Laban, or Laban, it said that it seemed like such a short time to him for the love he had for her. And he ended up spending 14 years because Laban or Laban gave him, Laban the Syrian gave him his oldest daughter Leah and made him think it was Rachel. And he had to, he had to work seven more years for Rachel. So he, he worked for this woman just to have her hand. He loved her so much for 14 years. So his soul is in anguish too. And the soul is the mediator between the world of the spirit and the world of the flesh. And Rachel's dying. And she's having hard labor. It's hard. She's having a hard time giving birth to Benjamin. And when it did, is when she was in that hard labor, she began to be afraid. And the midwife said, fear not, you'll have this child. But as her soul was departing, she was dying with her soul in anguish. And she died with it in anguish. And she prophesied from that anguished soul. Now, I need you to listen close to me. She prophesied from a soul of anguish and pain. And she said, call his name Benoni, son of pain. Now, they believed that they would just prophesy whatever was happening because men's spirit was dead to God. But their soul was a living soul, constantly a living soul. And he said, she said, call him after this pain I'm in. It must be what's supposed to be in his life, pain. Now, Jacob was in pain also. His soul was in anguish with her. And don't you know when she died, part of him did too. And this is what, what she said. She said, call his name Benoni. She called his name Benoni. She called it. She prophesied from her painful soul. And she would have shaped that boy's destiny. And one of the tribes of Israel would have been a tribe of pain from then on. Think about it. The apostle Paul came from the tribe of Benjamin. And it would have been a, a tribe of pain. But the old prophet that was there said no. He called his name Benjamin, which means son and strength of my right hand. His destiny was being shaped by a prophecy of the soul of pain. And the prophet Jacob, who had had an encounter with God, who had saw the top of the ladder, who had saw the Lord at the top, he knew how it all worked. He said, we cannot prophesy from the place of pain. He had to step back and say, on purpose, I shape his destiny and gave him a new destiny, Benjamin, son of my right hand, the strength of my right hand, son of happiness, in other words. J Jacob rose above the anguish of the soul and prophesied from the place of life. He prophesied from the place of life. Hallelujah. The battle for the soul of a nation is to corrupt the soul of a nation so to the point that we cry and prophesy in this nation out of pain. 
One of the saddest things about the LGBTQ and all of that is that it, it, it stops men and women from their real destiny. The Bible never says it's, a, it, it's an abomination to God. It says it's an abomination to the Lord. That's God in his system of life. It won't produce life. Therefore, your posterity can never come in the earth. It's to keep you from your destiny. And you may be the very one that's supposed to be a president or a congressman or, or, the, or the, the leader or king of a nation somewhere. You may be the very one, but it's a confining thing. And it brings you down to where you're a hybrid seed that won't produce. And your destiny dies with you. And there's no one to carry it forward. These old prophets and all, remember Jacob, whatever he prophesies, is prophesying to a nation. The nation of Israel was made up of 12 patriarchs, 12 parts of government to the soul. And it was the sound of each one. One tribe was mainly prophets. One was praisers. One was the, and on and on it just kept going. They had an expression of what the nation would be if it becomes corrupted in the soul. It'll never produce its destiny. And Rachel was dying. And her soul was in such anguish because of hard, listen now, hard labor. So a nation, to steal the soul of a nation, the nation has to be put into hard labor. It has to, they have to create shortages. They have to create uh, uh, financial woes. They have to put them in hard labor. It has to become hard to live every day till you work in pain constantly. Not just physically, but mentally. And to steal the soul of a nation, the battle for the soul of a nation the battle for the soul of the nation. It was, pro, it was proclaimed what it was over. But a lost world don't see that. But they're after the soul of this nation. You have to put it in hard bondage. You have to put it in a place of pain. Because most people are not spiritual. And they'll prophesy from the anguish of soul. They'll speak from the anguish of the soul. You can hear them talk right now just in everyday life. Uh, I've heard somebody say over and over, oh, this old age is the pits, isn't it? You lose your memory, you lose this, you lose that, and people just accept it. They'll say, I hate senior moments. Well, senior's supposed to be you're graduating. You're smarter than you ever were. You're finally in a place to teach another generation, but if you lose your ever-loving mind, you can't. And so they start prophesying out of the soul of anguish. And you start, and just like the, the speaker of the house here is a righteous man. God put him there. I even gave the prophetic word that Kevin McCarthy would suddenly leave, Remember? That he would just leave and it would just, he would just be gone and, and he was a temporary placeholder for something else. I remember giving the word. Then suddenly overnight he was gone. And then righteousness came in. Boy, everything changed. And then he invites a pastor to come and pray who don't believe and support the LGBTQ and all that. And the Democrats just started complaining immediately, saying, you should be more diversified. You should show more diversity. You, you, why, how dare you bring in somebody that only believes one way? Well, I got news for you. I, I say, you freaking idiot. Well, I got news for you. This right here don't support it either. And that's what the nation was built on. What is it? Try to corrupt the soul. The soul of a nation. Because if the soul of a nation is corrupt, and you see all of this immoral stuff until we've got litter kids,
kitty litter boxes in the girls' bathrooms. For what? You can't bring your pets to school. Oh, but I guess you could if you identify with one of them. Maybe you need, uh, maybe, well, you can bring your pets to school if it's your husband. Now people are marrying animals. Is the soul not being corrupted? The mind, the will, the emotions, and the soul of a nation is the Declaration of Independence built on the word of the living God written from sermons preached 150 years before it was ever written. Is it not being corrupted? Women's feminine products? Well, where is that put? Somebody tell me. They're putting it in the in yeah, public schools, but I mean what bathrooms? So now both bathrooms are carrying uh, f women's feminine products. And in the men's bathroom, so that the women, trans, the girls transitioning into a man will still have their products in the man's bathroom. Really? Well, then what's it going into the men's bathroom for? I mean, the other bathroom for? Well, maybe the men go over there and I don't even want to see that picture. I could say something crude, but I, I, I usually do, but I better not. So here, here the, only because the Lord said not. <laughs> but the, the saddest thing of all of this is how it kills the destinies of these precious people. I mean, you've got the image of God sitting in a litter box. Do you understand that sitting in a litter box? The very image of the Almighty. Don't you know Satan belly laughs at that? Why would they want men reduced to the level of an animal? Because you can yoke an ox and make him plow your fields. So all of the precious people that are trapped inside the LGBTQ chains, I'm going to tell you something. God has a destiny for you. He, he visited your conception the day you were conceived. That spark of light, that spark of electricity brought your future with it and all the gifts it takes to do it. And now your mind is tormented and you know it's tormented. Why? Because there's something in you crying to get out. And now a world shaping your thoughts to tell you this is the answer. And you live and die and never achieve destiny. So is it a message of hate or love now? Don't you see? God loves you with everything in him. And he's wooing you, calling you to come. Hallelujah. But if a nation can be, the soul of it can be corrupted. And the declaration be made to mean something it wasn't written to be, just like the soul of a person, the people will begin to prophesy from a corrupted soul. When they do, they're prophesying death. And watch this. They change whole destinies of people. It's all changed. They never achieved the destiny. And there are people that can get up in the morning, go to bed at night, and destroy your destiny and never lose a minute's sleep over it. There are people that go to bed at night and sleep like a log, as we say. They sleep like a log, knowing, and they know, and they smile before they close their eyes to sleep of how they brought another one in to destroy their destiny. Do you not see? going up and down streets on parades with balls stuck in your mouth and leather gags on your mouth. and If it's not to corrupt a soul, what's it for? One state told them, you can't do that in your parade in our state. They said, well, we just canceled the parade. Well, why couldn't you just walk down in business suits? Because it's all designed, it's the battle for the soul. 
The very party that said it was the battle for the soul of a nation was the very party that took God out of their platform during their, the last election cycle. They took him out. Well, I applaud the Speaker of the House for standing. Hallelujah. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm carrying my stand firm. Let nothing move you. Bible cover. Praise God. Amen. Now, so Rachel was prophesying from a, a place of a painful soul. And the only thing pain can prophesy is he's the son of pain. But the prophet who knew different had to overlook his pain too. He knows he's losing Rachel in this life. He's losing her and he's looking at that baby. And at the same time, that prophet has to transition from the heavy loss for what he's seeing. And he has to focus all of his love on the new life. And he says, in other words, this child is not going to go through life marked with pain. No, his name is not Benoni. The prophet called him Benjamin, son of, of my right hand, the strength of my right hand. And that's why the battles for the soul of a nation. If you corrupt the soul of a nation, the people prophesy woe. They speak pain. And someone else can name them who they are. You know, Klaus Schwab says you'll own nothing and be happy. That's what the Great Reset says. You'll own nothing and be happy. Think about it. Noah Harari, his prophet, they call him the prophet. They say that he's their prophet. You know what he said, don't you? He said, you either get on board or they won't need you as a serf or a slave. Well, he only named two classes of people. Them is the elite, but the other two classes were serfs and slaves. Well, they ain't neither one of them much good. I mean, the people are good, but the lives are not very promising. One's both are slaves. One you can do with a slave. You could do anything you wanted to them, and it wasn't against the law. A serf was bonded to the land. He was just a slave that had to be sold with the land. You study that out. It's to corrupt the soul. Of a nation. Then people can name you Benoni if they want to. Well, I hope that got across to people. We'll look at 2 Kings chapter 2 before we close today. Hallelujah. Oh, Brother Rabbit, you're talking about some heavy things. Yes. Yes, I am. Now, 2 Kings. Chapter 2, let's look at this. And I want you to see, it came to pass in verse 1, when the Lord would take up Elijah, Elijah, into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, uh, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went, they went down to Bethel, the house of God. And the sons of the prophets, these were places where prophets were taught and, and instructed and all in these different places. Well, the sons of the prophets that were there at the house of God, or Bethel, came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. Well, this happened here. They went down to Jericho. Elijah said unto him, to Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said, as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were in Jericho came to Elisha, or Elisha, and said unto him, knowest thou that the Lord... Yahweh will take away thy master from thy head today. And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. 
And Elijah said unto him, To Elisha, Tarry, I pray thee, here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. A place of seeing. It means flowing down. And spiritually, the place of seeing. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets, fifty men of the sons of the prophets. Wow, there was a lot of sons of the prophets. If 50 of them came out, listen now. It said, 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off. Now, they're not close. They're not, they're not down there where Elisha is or Elisha with a, uh, Elijah. They're not down there with him. They're standing afar off. And they, they watched him. The 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they too stood by Jordan. Now, you know, that's a big deal with prophets. A lot of prophets, you don't need to stand afar off in view. You need to be right there where things are going on. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters. If you're too far away, your view can be distorted. And they were divided hither and thither so that they too went over on dry ground. So there's only two of them. It came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha, or Elisha, that's how you really say it, said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see, see me when I'm taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass as they still went on and talked. Man, wouldn't you like to have been in on that conversation? that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. And he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he, he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither. And Elisha went over. That's a, that's a big miracle, my friend. That was a river. That's a flowing river. And it parted in two parts. Well, you can see where the other parts just held back, but where did the other go? It's just there. That's a, that's a notable miracle. And he said this, now watch. They parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. And when the sons of the prophets, which were to view at Jericho, those afar off, saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah does rest on Elisha. Well, that was obvious. That's an obvious prophecy. Now, I'm, I'm saying that for a reason. Listen now, that was obvious. They saw him part that Jordan. And they came to meet him. Now they're coming close. And they bowed themselves to the ground before him. And they said unto him, Behold now, there be with thy servants fifty strong men. Let them go, we pray thee, and seek thy master, lest peradventure the Spirit of the Lord hath had taken him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And he said, You shall not sin. Now, do you notice this? The fifty strong men are the ones viewing afar off. Well, they got a lot of strength. They're far off. They didn't have the nerve to go down there. But when he came back across, suddenly they go down there. Well, now watch. But this is the reason they go. They looked at each other. The spirit of Elijah is on Elisha. Well, that didn't take a lot of profit to recognize that. I mean, you could see that. He did what Elijah did. He's wearing his mantle, and he hid it with his mantle. So they run down there. There's 50 of us here. They're strong. Let us go and search for Elijah because it may be that the Spirit of the Lord, now listen to what they said. The Spirit of the Lord has dashed him up on the rocks. Now listen to that. Or through him in peradventure, the Spirit of the Lord hath taken him up, cast him up on some mountain. He may be up there on that mountain. Could be that the Spirit of the Lord, that whirlwind, jerked him up, threw him up there on that mountain. He's laying up there dead. And watch this. Or may cast him into some valley. He may be on the other side of that mountain in that valley. 
And he said, you shall not go. Elisha said, don't go. When they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, send. Could you imagine the tone of his voice? Send. They sent therefore 50 men. They sought him three days, the number of resurrection, but found him not. And when they came again to him, for he tarried at Jericho, Elisha waited at Jericho, and he said unto them, Did I not say unto you, Go not? And the men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant. It's cursed. The city was cursed by Joshua. They said it's pleasant. The vision of the prophets are distorted because they've only been looking afar off. They haven't been down right with what God is doing. He said, watch now, it's pleasant as my Lord seeth, but the water is naught and the ground barren. He said, bring me a new cruise and put salt therein. And they brought it to him. And he went forth. Now watch, he's about to show the prophets what they're born to do. Unto the spring of the waters and cast the salt in there and said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. <clears throat> there shall not be therefore uh, from thence any more death or barren land. So the waters were healed unto this day according to the saying of Elisha which he spake. And I've been right there and I saw him and even the guide there said, This is Elisha Springs. It's when he healed the waters. It's still a water with date palm trees growing everywhere in the middle of nothing. He told those other prophets, this is what you were called to do. On this side of the Jordan, Elijah went over there. He was caught away. Elisha came back. He said, now your job in the prophetic is to heal curses. You're supposed to prophesy and heal curses. And so a prophetic word was given by Elisha and salt in a bowl or a cruise of water. And he poured it at the head of the springs. And suddenly the waters were healed and everything could flourish around it. And he was showing them, this is your job. They were prophesying out of the anguish of the soul. When the spirit of Elijah is on Elisha. Let us go because the Spirit of the Lord has probably killed him. The anguish of their prophesying from their soul. The city looks good, as you can see, Elisha, but it's barren. Elisha could have prophesied with them. He wouldn't prophesy from his soul. He stayed with life. He stayed with life. And now the curse, the curse had come to an end. How did it end? Well, Joshua said, he said, whoever rebuilds this city, you'll lay the foundation in your firstborn and you'll hang the gates in your youngest. A rich Jewish man named Heel built the city. And he, that very thing happened to him. But after the time of Ahab and, uh, and Elijah and that prophecy, when his youngest died, the curse of that city ended. And Elisha said, now it's time to bring life and prophesy life into curse and make an oasis. And so that's what we're here to do. That's what we've got to do now. We have to start prophesying life. We have to start speaking life over this nation. We have to start speaking life to the soul of a generation. We have to start talking about life because uh, it's obvious that everything's been living under a curse for so long. It's because that people, no matter what happens, no matter what's said or done, you see people occupying D.C., you see people occupying high positions and they're not even supposed to be there speaking death speaking death trying to keep the curse going 
when Kavanaugh and Gorsuch, remember when Chuck Schumer spoke while they were in there voting on an abortion thing. He said, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, if you don't do right, vote right on this, the, you'll, you'll reap the whirlwind. Trying to keep that going. But it's time for the curse to end. It's time to prophesy life. Even in this election cycle, Noah Harari said himself, the prophet of the great reset they, they think he is. The global thing, he said, if Donald Trump's elected president this time, it'll be the death blow to the global government that we've tried to work on. Even he recognizes it's over. And so you see people attacking. They find him 80-something million dollars, 300-something million dollars, and now they're saying any, many more fines, you have to sell off assets. and Oh, they're trying to bankrupt it. Bankrupt the man because it's just like my father-in-law told me one time. He said, I don't care how rich you are, there's a bottom to that bucket somewhere. And they're trying to empty his bucket. Why? Because even Harari said if he wins, it's the death blow to what we've tried to do. But you don't want to be a serf and a slave. You don't want to do that. So you can't prophesy out of pain. You have to prophesy from the place of life. If your soul is allowed to prophesy, it gets dangerous. It can get dangerous to destiny. If your soul is allowed to just do the prophecy... It gets dangerous to, to destiny of yours and others. The soul will prophesy out of pain. Like Rachel was in pain. Jacob was in pain. But Jacob knew and he worked. He did this. He knew how to prophesy. He had worked for, to get her 14 years. His, his soul was hurting too. People had grown to the place of being dictated by circumstances and pain. This is where it was for the most part. People had grown to the place they thought God was doing all of this pain. And so they were dictated to by pain and prophesied from the place of pain. Elijah and Elisha and the prophets who said that the Lord killed Elijah a prophecy of the soul, but Elisha had seen what happened in the spirit. Glory to God. And I believe that's the, what the message G-I-A-G is to erase in the, mind, in, the, in the souls of people, is to erase those marks, those painful things in the soul so that God's people can prophesy from the spirit and not from the soul. Hallelujah. Well, that's, that's all the teaching on that today. But we have to begin to prophesy to the nation. We have to prophesy from a place in the spirit of life. Hallelujah. Come and play for me, please. So we have to begin to uh, adjust our our thinking. We have to begin to do that. If the band's here, y'all can all get up there if you'd like. Hallelujah. So I want you right now to lift your hands wherever you are and begin to bless the Lord. Come on and begin to bless the Lord. Begin to thank Him for all that He is and all that He does. Those trapped in yokes of bondage and chains of pain. And you know you have a destiny awaiting ahead of you. Begin to, to worship and praise God. Begin to do that now. Invite Jesus to come in your heart and be your Lord and Savior and King. He will come. And when He comes... He'll change everything so that you don't prophesy and speak from the place of the painful soul. 
So begin to call on him. Say, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and personal Savior. Free me from this yoke of bondage that I'm yoked in this LGBTQ thing, that I'm chained down in this homosexual lifestyle. Free me, Lord. Free me from it and show me my destiny. Let the light of God come in to my soul and free me. And he will come. And when he comes... He will come to set you on the road to your destiny. A place of happiness you've never known. A place of freedom you've never seen. A place of happiness. To where you're not called Ben-Onai, child of pain anymore. Now you're referred to as child of happiness, Benjamin the strength of his right hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on and lift your voice and lift your hands in praise. Come on and lift your voice. Lift your hands in praise and sing. And sing. Come on and lift your hands in praise. Lift your hands in praise. Lift your voice in praise. And sing. And sing. Come on down. And sing. And sing. time we say lift your hands and praise lift your voice and praise lift your hands and praise lift your voice and sing lift your voice and sing and praise once more and praise back to it now Come on, everybody. Come on and lift your hands and praise. Lift your hands and praise. Come on, everybody. Lift your hands and praise. Lift your voice. Lift your voice and sing. And praise. And praise. And praise. Come on. Come on, yeah, that's it. Come on, lift your hands. Oh, lift your hands and praise. Come on, lift your hands and praise. Lift your hands and praise. Lift your voice. Lift your voice and sing. this nation I prophesy to this nation for your soul to be healed 
for righteousness to be like the balm of Gilead. Come in the soul of America. Come in the soul of this nation. Let righteousness be the balm of Gilead that soothes the soul and brings it back to a righteous beginning, a righteous thought, a righteous soul in the nation of, of America. In the United States of America, I prophesy that righteousness will reign again, that righteousness will come again and reign in the soul. And we prophesy from a righteous soul that this nation will be a it will be proclaimed again around the world as a Christian nation. Proclaimed from the very heights of the presidency in the White House. A Christian nation. A Christian nation. A nation. A nation. Not a democracy, but a republic. A republic. A republic based on the laws, the unchangeable laws of the living God that it was built upon. America, be made whole. Be made whole. Whole be made whole. Come on, come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Be made whole. Come on, share with me. Be made whole. America, be made whole. Be made whole. Be made whole. Prophesy that to your nation. Prophesy it unto your nation. You know, this nation is a republic. It would be a democratic republic where you get to vote on some things. But you cannot be just a democracy. Or 51% of the people could vote murder as legal. As long as a majority said it was right, it was right. That's in the scripture in the book of Judges when it talks about how men did what was right in their own eyes. And you see the atrocities that happened. I mean, terrible things happened. And you can see, you can see in there where homosexuality ran rampant until they surrounded a house and demanded people to come forth that they may know them sexually. And a man threw his concubine out to them. And they raped her all night, the men of the city, until she crawled to the threshold of the door and died. The next morning, he just got up and said, up, let's be on our way. And when she couldn't get up because she was dead, this was the man's grand solution. He decapitated her body and sent it to the tribes of Israel and said, this is what they have done. And so all the people in the tribes of Israel, they got, came together and was going to annihilate the tribe of Benjamin. This is what happens when men do what's right in their own eyes. And you can't run a nation they say it's a threat of the democracy, the democracy. Well, we're a republic. We're a democratic republic. We vote on some things, sidewalks. We get to vote on how we trade, maybe on in nations, the goods. But you don't get to vote on killing the unborn. That's not, that's a law of, of, of nature and nature's God. That's the law of God. You, you have no right to change that. There's some things you can't vote on. You can never vote whether murder will be right. Because it's not right in the laws of God. These are unchangeable. And you wasn't given your freedoms by government. Your freedoms came from God himself. And government, according to the book of Romans, is only raised up to protect those freedoms. And that's the way our nation was founded. A total democracy with no, nothing else is mob rule. That's what it amounts to, just mob rule. The founding fathers hated that. 
So they gave us a democratic republic built on the unchangeable laws of the Creator. Hallelujah. Righteousness will reign in America. Hallelujah. It's a futile thing to think you can undo a covenant that was made between God and these founding fathers before you were ever born. Let's lift our hands and praise. Let's lift our voice and say, God is God today. Jesus is the only way and that will never change. It will never change, never change. Come on, come on. Let's lift our voice and say, God is God today. God is God today. Jesus is, Jesus is the only way. Let's lift our voice and say, Let's go ahead and receive that offering now. We'll receive it into this atmosphere. And while the anointing's high and the, the thought of covenant is high and we're not prophesying out of an anguished soul, you're actually sowing seed into life. God's system of life is seed, plant, and harvest. You're actually sowing a seed into life. And so you can sow for a future that otherwise you didn't have. See, governments or anyone else can't control the income of a free people that know Jesus. Because the Lord will, the Bible says he ministers seed to the sower. It doesn't say he gives seed to the sower, it says he ministers it to the sower. He gives bread to the eater, but he ministers this seed. In other words, he tells you where to sow seed. Because just like you sow corn and reap corn. But you know, you can sow one kernel of corn and you can reap a stalk seven feet high with seven ears on each stalk, 750 kernels per ear from one kernel. You just drop a kernel or so in the ground and, and it's nurtured, right? And if it's good ground, it'll produce a lot more than you put in it. And it's that way with everything that nourishes you. It's that way with God. It's that way Jesus said, lest I die and fall to the ground like a seed. He said, I can't grow up and produce all of you. And so he, he planted himself for us. You're his harvest. That's why you're heirs. You're the heirs and joint heirs with Jesus. So it's the same way with everything. Your clothes came through that system of harvest. Your, your, you came through that system of harvest. You were a seed. You got planted and you grew up. And now look at you. Man, you have a voice. You have a mind. You have a future. You have a destiny. Well, he didn't leave it out at that. He did the same thing with your finances. He talks about tithing. Jacob discovered the tithe at the top of that ladder. He said, man, if this is the way, he said, I see the gate to heaven. If this is the way it works, I'm going to give a tenth of everything I have. And those angels were going up that ladder, taking tithe, coming down that ladder with harvest. Going up to get men's harvest and bringing it back. He said, if that's the way this works, I'm going to give a tenth of everything I have. 
And so we're told in Malachi 3.10, it said, Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I'll not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake, and he'll not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome watch land saith the Lord of hosts you become ground that people sow into also you become a delightsome land you everything about you starts to flourish and grow well he also said in Luke 6 38 give and it shall be given to you good measure pressed down shaken together running over shall men give into your bosom for with the same measure that you meet with all it'll be measured to you again well he didn't say what you give he just said whatever you give It'll happen this way. It'll be measured back to you. So whatever you give will come back. Well, I don't have no friends. We'll give friendship. It'll come back. I, I, people are not friendly to me. We'll be friendly. You can got a harvest. You can call on it. Somebody's being unfriendly to you. You can say, no, I call on my harvest. I'm always friendly to people. I make it a point to be friendly to people. You'd be amazed how that situation changes. And then at the amount you give. Well, he didn't say what you give. He just said, whatever you give, it's given to you good measure, pressed down, shaken together. You give in teaspoons, you get back a bunch of teaspoons. You give in shovels, you get back a bunch of shovels. Dump trucks, you give back a bunch of dump. Whatever you give, it shall be measured back to you again. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give to your bosom. So you make this a point of sowing in faith for your future for your future well i only have a quarter well won't you hold that quarter up and, and 20 your 25 cent piece and say you know i'm gonna stick this in your face devil i'm gonna give this in your face as i sow it into god's kingdom and it will come back man things will change for you activate the word Activated in faith. Hallelujah. There's too much seed, too much blood in the ground for this nation and the free world for this nation to be finished. America's not finished. We've got soldiers who planted their lives in foreign ground just to free you and other nations and to keep this nation free. You have the right to call on those seeds, and I do too. This nation's not going down. I don't care how much a bunch of jackals bark and howl at the moon at night. It's not going down. It's not time for it to go, go down. The, the great revival has started, and we're not leaving here until we see a billion souls saved. Then we'll go eat supper with the Lord and eat this as Garland was talking to me about that meal the other night, we're going to eat that meal. Don't tell him every time Jesus eats a meal, it seems like he elevates you somewhere. We're going to go eat that marriage supper of the Lamb and start cruising out, man. Where are we going from there? He said, we're coming back here. And so the new Jerusalem will even come down over the old Jerusalem, bringing heaven to earth, and it will be forever this way. Hallelujah. So if you're giving today, go ahead and give and and give in that kind of faith and say, as I give, it's given to me good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give to my bosom. For with this measure I meet, it'll be measured to me again. Go ahead and pray that. Luke 6, 38, stand on the blessing of the tither and no racism will work against you. He said, all nations, all these nationalities, all these ethnic groups will call you blessed. So no matter where you are, the law of God will work. Hallelujah. 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 So uh, I guess there's ways to give on the screen, and you just come with your offering, whatever it may be. If you say, I don't even have anything to give, you have no idea. I don't even have a box of macaroni and cheese to eat. I remember when I was a boy, a box of macaroni and cheese was absolutely my supper every night because we lived on a quarter a day for 30 days in the, in the 1960s the late 60s. I remember that. If we hadn't lived above a doctor's office, we'd have died. And, and 
we were abandoned and my mother was just there with us and, and she cleaned up the office and my grandmother worked for 50 cents a day and sent us half of what she had and we, we actually lived on about a quarter a day because back then you could buy a loaf of bread and a box of macaroni and cheese for that. And now you don't know how much macaroni and cheese, ketchup, and bread I ate. So you say, that's all I got. But won't you take one of them macaronis? I wish somebody taught me that when I was a kid. We'd have took that macaroni and stuck it up there and said, Lord, I'm giving you this as an offering. Oh, my goodness. God can take a few loaves and fish and feed a multitude. He can sure take a macaroni and do it. Hallelujah. Man. Stories of provision. Hallelujah. It's like that guy in prison, you know, he went in to preach in prison and he had these, I don't know if it was Coca Cola's or Pepsi's or whatever he had, but he had them in a cooler and he only had so many. And he had enough to give to the men that was going to be listening to him preach, and all of a sudden they all came in there. And he can't cut the line off when he runs out of these Coca Cola's. So he just wouldn't look. He'd just pray and take a bottle, open it, and hand it to the next one. And he gave everybody in there a Coca-Cola. <laughs> they were multiplying. Man, I don't believe that. You probably don't believe nothing, do you? I mean, somebody, somebody just watch this stuff just to criticize it. Well, I don't believe that. I don't believe that's supernatural. I don't, but you probably leave a real miserable life, don't you? You lead a miserable existence. You don't believe nothing compared, uh, other than what you can see. Well, I'm a realist. What you mean is, is you don't believe nothing but what you can look at. Man, that's got to be a miserable existence. Well, I don't believe them stories you're telling are real. Well, you wasn't there, so I don't give a big fat rat's butt about that. I, you, don't, you wasn't there with me. You wasn't there when we had nothing with a big ing on the end of it. You weren't there. You weren't there. You can't know. But I don't believe it. I don't care. It happened anyway. And nothing you can say will change. That's like, man, I don't believe that. that people, that's like that, that stupid ridiculousness when people try to deny the Holocaust. It never happened. It never happened. Are you a, are you just a, are, are you, are you an idiot? Did you work at that? Or was you just born that stupid? I mean, I, I wonder sometimes. I question the intelligence of people. Or there's another agenda involved. And the latter is the, is the problem. That's why I wear sometimes my resist tyranny pin. So you don't like me because I'm a Jew. I'm, I'm full throughout in my heart. In my heart I am. I say, you don't know if you are or not. Well, I might be. I might be. It sure strongly pushes that way on one side and Native American on the other. But I'll tell you what's right here now is a seed of Abraham. I'm the seed of Abraham. I'm like Robin says, I'm going to that family reunion wearing one of them t-shirts that says, the seed of Abraham, the family of Abraham. Hallelujah. Well, it's been good to be with you today on the 11th hour. Um, if you've never been baptized in the Holy Ghost, this would be a good time to do that. And if you're a believer and you say, well, you know, I'm just like an agnostic that don't even sound good. You're a ag what? Hell, I'm one of them Gnostics. That sounds like a nasal problem. I'm, I'm an agnostic. You know, that sounds like a farmer with a nasal problem. You uh, Breathing hay. I, I, I've done that. But don't be that in the spirit. People. Now, can you see people who say, oh, he talked about farmers. Man, are you kidding? I grew up one. <laughs> That's what I grew up. Oh, people. Mm. He said, well, I'm just an agnostic. I don't even know what that means. I don't, I don't, I don't want to be one of them. Here, here's what you do. 
You get baptized in the Holy Ghost and real power take hold of your very core and shake it like a dog almost. Man, your life changes. How do you do that? Well, you say, Jesus, baptize me in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Well, I don't know if I believe in them other tongues. Do you believe in Jesus? Yes. Well, he believes in other tongues. Remember on the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. What was he talking in? Everybody that spoke every known language was standing around him, really. They didn't understand what he said. Italians didn't. Romans were there, so he wasn't speaking Italian. Greeks were there, he wasn't speaking Greek. Uh, Hebrew people were surely there, he wasn't speaking that. Aramaic, he didn't. They were there, but nobody knew what he said it had to be interpreted. So that's something that God gives you, and you start speaking in that language, and you, you go right back to the language between God and the first Adam, the language of the Spirit, talking revelation knowledge in the heavenly language. My God, man, that's big. And when you don't know what to pray for in English, you can pray in them tongues, man, and it'll start. And then all of a sudden, you do it long enough, it's like that computer. You know, you type it in, and all of a sudden, it comes up the answer. Boom! It's because that sound is searching the database. And he prays in tongues. The Holy Ghost takes hold together with you, and you start searching the mysteries of God. Amen. And then it comes up interpretation. So right now, say, Jesus, baptize me in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Now, don't look for a feeling. Don't deny a feeling, but don't look for it. Just lift your hands and start thanking him for filling you with the Holy Ghost. And now start praising him, and now pray in other tongues. <laughs> A while ago when Roxanne was interceding in other tongues, we were prophesying, getting ready to prophesy over a nation. And the nation, if you're uh, into the nation, to the masses, into the very soul of a nation. And we didn't have the words for that, but the Holy Ghost did. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do we have anything else we're doing today? All right. Well, we'll, we encourage you to send in your prayer request. And, uh, yeah, I don't know why I said that. Prayer request, that's good. Send that in. Because we have an international prayer stream tonight. It'll be there tonight. Now, you want to you won't take advantage of that. We have a corporate prayer here at Church International tonight. If you want to come to that, you're welcome to come. It's a, it's a big prayer meeting. But we also have Johnny and Chrissy will be on tonight on the international prayer stream. And you, you get your prayer request ready. And if you don't get to make that one, you send it into the 11th hour and we'll pass it to them and we'll pray over you ourselves. You send them in. We'll pray over it. We'll, we'll do it as a corporate unit right here. We'll pray over them. You send them in. Hallelujah. If you've got praise reports, be sure and send them in. Amen. Well, it's been good today, hasn't it? It's been a good 11th hour today, hasn't it? Praise God. Anything? Anything? We good? Anything? No? All right. Well, until next time, we gather together right here around God's Word. I want you to remember and never forget that God is absolutely good. Shalom, shalom.